The House Government Reform Committee held a hearing today on former President Clinton's pardon of financier Mark Rich. Committee members heard testimony from Jack Quinn, counsel to Mr. Rich, Eric Holder, former Deputy Attorney General, and Beth Nolan, former counsel to President Clinton. The hearing is about seven and a half hours. If we could ask uh, everyone to take their seats. We'll try to um, ask everyone in the audience to uh, be as uh, quiet as possible. The acoustics in this room, like all committee rooms, is not as uh, good as we'd like. It's better than it used to be. So if you could uh, bear with us, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we have a capacity audience here today, so conversation is uh, really a problem. Well, once again, good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will once again come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that a set of exhibits which was shared with the minority prior to the meeting be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the Committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between the majority and minority, and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to Committee Council as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes divided equally between the majority and minority and without objection so ordered. Let me uh, clarify that just a little bit. I talked to Mr. Waxman, the Ranking uh, Member, Minority Member, and uh, uh, we have agreed that uh, the extended questioning will be for, uh, uh, will be 60 minutes in total for each side, 30 minutes for uh, the majority, 30 minutes for the minority, and then for counsel on each side, uh, limited to 30 minutes, and all other questioning will be under the five-minute rule. I now recognize my colleague, Mr. Waxman. Oh, excuse me, one second. Okay. Today, uh, we're going to be looking into the pardon of Mark Rich. A few weeks ago, on his last day in office, President Clinton pardoned 140 people. Some of these pardons were probably meritorious. Others, we think, were not. The Mark Rich pardon has been particularly controversial. Uh, our position is simple. The American people deserve to know the facts. At this point in time, we don't know all the facts. That's why we're holding this hearing. Last night, we received some news that I find troubling. Mr. Rich's ex-wife, Denise Rich. It's been well reported that she gave $1 million to Democratic campaigns over the last decade. It's also been well reported that she sent pre the President a letter asking for this pardon. She also talked to the President about the pardon. We asked Mrs. Rich, through her lawyer, to answer a number of questions. Last night, we received a letter from her lawyer stating that Mrs. Rich is going to take the Fifth Amendment and not respond to our questions. I ask unanimous consent that this letter be placed in the record, without objection so ordered. I find it very, very troubling that in a case like this, where the public simply wants an explanation, that a central figure would take the Fifth Amendment. But that's not all. We were also informed by Mrs. Rich's lawyer that Mrs. Rich has given an, quote, enormous amount of money to the Clinton Presidential Library. We want to know how much is enormous. That's something else we need to find out and how that plays in the overall scheme of things. Let's step back and take a quick look at why Mark Rich and his pardon was controversial. In 1983, he was indicted on more than 50 counts of wire fraud, tax evasion, racketeering, and violating the Iranian oil embargo. He was accused of evading $48 million in taxes. It was the largest tax fraud case in U.S. history. He faced up to 300 years in prison if he was convicted on all counts. Mr. Rich fled the country, went to Switzerland and elsewhere to avoid prosecution. He renounced his U.S. citizenship and took up residence in Switzerland for 17 years. <clears throat> 
His companies were found in contempt of court and fined $20 million for defying a judge's order. All told, they paid $200 million in penalties. His aides were caught smuggling subpoenaed documents out of the country in trunks. I believe it was on a Swiss airplane. He was the subject of hearings in this committee in 1991 and 1992. At that time, the Bush administration was accused of not doing enough to try to bring Mark Rich to justice. And at that time, the House was controlled by the opposition party, the Democrat Party, and as we feel today, they thought that uh, more needed to be done to make sure that Mr. Rich be brought to justice. On the surface, this doesn't look like a very good case for a pardon. So the question we have is, how did it happen? We asked this same question some time ago about the 14 Puerto Rican terrorists who killed policemen in New York, who blew up restaurants with innocent citizens in them, and was involved in the lar largest uh, armored car robbery in history. We didn't receive any information about that pardon either from the White House, and we just want an explanation, and I think the American people would like to know what happened. We don't know all the facts yet, and that's one of the main reasons we're here today. However, this much seems clear. There is a procedure that's usually followed to consider pardons. In, that, in this case, that procedure was not followed. There is a pardon attorney at the Justice Department. Pardon applications are submitted to the pardon attorney for review. After they've been thoroughly reviewed, the Justice Department then makes a recommendation, and the application is sent to the President for a decision. In this case, none of that happened. Mr. Rich is represented today by Jack Quinn. Mr. Quinn was President Clinton's White House counsel. They had a very close relationship. On December 11th, Mr. Quinn delivered Mrs. Rich, Mr. Rich's application directly to the White House. It was never sent to the pardon attorney, and it was never reviewed by the Justice Department. Why not? Why did the President make such an important decision without getting input from the pardon attorney or the prosecutors or the Justice Department? We know from reading the newspapers that Mr. Quinn contacted the Deputy Attorney General, Eric Holder, to tell him that he was going to submit the application. What did Mr. Holder do with that information? Did he contact the pardon attorney? Did he tell the prosecutors in New York who were responsible for the case? The fact is that we don't know exactly what Mr. Holder did. Mr. Quinn has suggested in the press that Mr. Holder was at least neutral, leaning towards this application and that he may have communicated this to the White House. We haven't heard from Mr. Holder yet, but we want to have his side of the story as well. Mr. Quinn and Mr. Holder are here today to testify voluntarily. We appreciate the fact that they've come, and we look forward to getting some of this information. We also want to know what advice was given to the President. The White House had this application for over a month before the pardon was granted. What kind of a process did they follow? Is there a file there that we should have? What kind of information did they ask for? Who did they consult? We asked the counsel to the president, Beth Nolan, to testify today. We asked one of the president's closest, closest advisors, Bruce Lindsay, to testify. They both turned us down, which I find very disappointing. But we'll get their testimony some other time. Did the White House ask our intelligence agencies for information about Mr. Rich? And this is very important. They did not. This week, we learned that the White House apparently didn't even bother to consult intelligence agencies. Why not? Mr. Rich was publicly reported to have traded with just about every enemy of the United States has had over the last 20 years, and many of those countries were embargoed. One case that stands out glaringly is Iran. We had hostages over there at the time that Mr. Rich was trading with them. Uh, he violated the embargo. He was working with the Iranians, selling their oil and uh, our hostages, American citizens, were languishing in those you know, under very difficult circumstances for a long, long time at that, uh, at that time. The President should have taken an hour to get a briefing from our security agencies and from our intelligence agencies. Twenty minutes would have been enough. After having been briefed by our intelligence agencies, my legal staff informed me about some of the things that were in those intelligence briefings. And I believe that this pardon has been raised to a higher level because of things that are in those intelligence reports. We've asked that some of this information be declassified. I know member, many members of the media want to know what's in those intelligence reports, and we're going to try to get them declassified so the American people can know exactly what happened. And I hope they will be.
If those reports are declassified, I think it will be clear that the President failed to get all the facts that he should have before he pardoned Mr. Rich or he ignored them. We have two additional witnesses that I haven't mentioned. Appearing on our first panel will be Sandy Weinberg, Jr. and Martin Auerbach. They were prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. They worked on the Rich case. Mr. Quinn has raised a number of issues with the indictments brought by the U.S. Attorney's Office. On CNN last night, Mr. Quinn said that the indictment that was brought was really, truly worthless. We asked Mr. Weinberg and Mr. Auerbach to be here today to talk about and defend their work. We're looking forward to their testimony. I again want to thank all of our witnesses for being here. I want to admonish the lawyers for the witnesses that, the, that only the witnesses may testify. The attorneys may consult with their clients for as long as needed, but under our procedures, only the witnesses may testify. Let me stop here and wrap up my opening statement. It's obvious that right now we have a lot more questions than answers. We have witnesses here who are prepared to answer questions, so I want to move forward. I now yield to Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Over the uh, last eight years, President Clinton and his administration have been the target of a remarkable number of false accusations. In turn, these accusations have received a staggering amount of media attention. I've often spoken out about the unfairness of these smears, and at the end of the last Congress, I even compiled an analysis that attempts to collect many of the reckless accusations in one report. And I ask unanimous consent that this report be made part of this record. This report is entitled, Unsubstantiated Allegations of Wrongdoing Involving the Clinton Administration. Without objection. As this report documents, the President and his aides did not deserve many of the criticisms they received over the last eight years. But a president does deserve criticism when he makes a mistake. And in this case, I think that's what former President Clinton did when he pardoned Mark Rich and Pincus Green. It's true that the power to issue federal pardon rests solely with the president. There is no role for the Congress or the courts. The only check on the abuse of this power is the judgment of the president. The best use of presidential pardons are for correcting injustices against those with little power or money. In fact, President Clinton did exactly that in many instances. One good example is Derek Curry. In 1989, Mr. Curry, a young black college student, was sentenced to 20 years in prison with no chance of parole for his first drug offense. The judge who sentenced Mr. Curry reluctantly sentenced him to 20 years in prison because he had no choice under the federal sentencing guidelines. Pardons are particularly appropriate as well for those who have accepted punishment have demonstrated true repentance, and have subsequently done good works for society. For a president leaving office, it can be an invaluable opportunity to put aside public opinion polls and act courageously. The Mark Rich pardon meets none of these criteria. It's clear from the materials that Jack Quinn prepared that Mr. Rich had a credible legal argument against prosecution. But that argument should have been made in our courts. The rich pardon is a bad precedent. It appears to set a double standard for the wealthy and the powerful. And it is an end run around the judicial process. Think about it for a minute. One week, Mark Rich is on the Justice Department's list of the 10 most wanted. And the next week, He's given a presidential pardon. This makes no sense. Something has to happen in between. They can't, this gap can't be bridged in just one big jump. But under the current system, the president is allowed to make bad judgments that all of us disagree with when he issues pardons. That's how the system works. For example, 
questions were raised when just before leaving office in 1993, President Bush pardoned Aslam Adam, a Pakistani individual who had been convicted of conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute $1 million worth of heroin. Both the prosecutor and the judge who sentenced Mr. Adam reportedly did not want him freed. Questions were also raised when on December 24, 1992, President Bush pardoned, then President Bush pardoned, former Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger. Mr. Weinberger was being investigated by the independent counsel Lawrence Walsh regarding the Iran-Contra matter and was scheduled for a trial on, ja on January 5th, within a month. The independent counsel, Walsh, called the pardon terrible and grossly wrong. But President Bush had the power to issue that pardon. And when a president makes a bad judgment, whether it's former President Bush or former President Clinton, it's appropriate for us in the Congress to raise questions and express our views. There is a crucial distinction, however, between bad judgment and a presidential scandal. Here's the key issue this morning. Is this a case of bad judgment, or is it a case involving bribery, corruption, or criminal conduct? To date, I see plenty of bad judgment, but no evidence of criminal wrongdoing has been presented to us to this point. And I see no indication that we're going to get any evidence along those lines. This distinction is important to how this committee proceeds. Unless there is compelling evidence of illegal conduct by President, former President Clinton, the committee should not embark on a search for another scandal. The committee should put away its subpoenas and shelve its endless document requests. I do want to make a note for the record that Chairman indicated Beth Nolan uh, refused to come and cooperate with the committee. Uh, Beth Nolan, as the counsel uh, for, um, as the White House counsel for former President Clinton, served admirably with great distinction in that position. And she is uh, out of the country on vacation. She has not indicated her unwillingness to come before us or to assist the committee, but that she was unable to be with us today. Well, in the spirit of bipartisanship, I'm withholding judgment on today's hearings until we get the testimony from the witnesses. But if there's no evidence of wrongdoing, if there's only evidence of clear bad judgment by President Clinton, which I strict, sincerely see in his action, I will strongly object if this committee embarks on another wild goose chase. Everyone is eventually going to have to come to grip with the facts that President Clinton is no longer president. And there's been a cottage industry, and this committee's been part of it, for Clinton's scandals. Well, this cottage industry at some point is going to have to go out of business. We've got other matters before us that deserve very, very careful attention through oversight and investigative responsibilities. Mr. Chairman, I, I have no quarrel with your holding this hearing today because we ought to get the evidence before us. Let's get that evidence. If it simply shows bad judgment, I don't want to say simply, but if it shows bad judgment, I think we ought to uh, recognize that uh, President uh, Clinton is to be um, uh, uh, criticized by us all for the judgment that he made. But if it's a bad judgment by the president, the Constitution gives him that authority to make that judgment, and we ought to uh, let the, re the matter rest. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman from California. Are, is there further comment from members of the committee? If not, uh, uh, gentlemen, Jim, right now. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, as we begin this hearing, I urge all the members of this committee to keep its purpose in mind. This hearing should be about whether President Clinton acted within his authority and followed the law in granting a pardon to Mark Rich, period. This hearing should not be about relitigating the Mark Rich case. Our job should be to review the circumstances around the pardon, 
and sort through the allegations that have been made in a fair and impartial way. I want to remind all of my colleagues that Bill Clinton is no longer the President of the United States, in case you're not aware. If people do not approve of this pardon, history will judge Bill Clinton and should not, we should not waste a lot of time on this matter. This committee has spent a great deal of time investigating and investigating and investigating the Clintons and the Clintons' past when we should have been working on the prescription drug bill for our seniors and many instances have to make a decision as to whether to purchase their medication or buy food due to the lack of income. I hope this hearing will be the end of these partisan pursuits. We can all speculate about whether or not we would have granted the pardon had we been the President of the United States. But that is not important today. The President has the authority to grant pardons, and the framers of the Constitution gave him that right. Let's be clear. The pardon has already been granted, and there is nothing that any of us can do to revoke it, overturn it, or stop it. For those reasons, let's make this a positive exercise today. From what I have seen in the witnesses' testimony and press accounts, uh, the process worked properly in this case. Jack Quinn did his job as a lawyer. Oh. Eric Holder did his job representing the views of the Justice Department and being responsive to the White House. The White House Counsel's Office did its job reviewing the pardon applications and making a recommendation to the President. President Clinton did his job thoughtfully reviewing the pardon applications, considering all the facts, seeking the counsel or his advisors in the Justice Department and making a decision which he acknowledged was a close call. A number of people have questioned this pardon because it was not first considered by the Justice Pardon Office. While that is probably the best course of action as a general rule, this case is not unique in this regard. Nothing in the law requires that a pardon first be reviewed by the Justice Department because of the President's absolute power to pardon. The policies, procedure, and processes are entirely at the President's discretion. A number of the pardons which President Clinton granted were not considered by the Department of Justice first. I look forward to hearing the witnesses' testimony and hope that my colleagues will focus on process and the facts rather than on relitigating this case and pursuing the president and the parties involved in a partisan manner as we have done so many times in the past. I hope we do not go down that road today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Mr. Towns, uh, is there anyone uh, on the majority side? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Latore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't going to speak, but I. Uh, now that I've heard from Mr. Waxman and Mr. Towns, I, I do want to make a, an observation. I, I think it's a good thing that we will focus on process today, and I don't think it's the intention of anyone uh, on the majority side to relitigate the, uh, the Mark Rich matter. Uh, but one of the things that I, I think that concerns me and is a, a proper subject to the jurisdiction of an oversight committee uh, in the United States Congress has to do with uh, the matter of, of ethics, uh, and in particular the ethics commitments made by uh, people who serve not only the legislative branch but also the executive branch. And, and I, for one, uh, was surprised when I saw Mr. Quinn on television representing Mr. Rich. And, and uh, I do have some questions about uh, how it is that uh, a former representative of the executive branch can then lobby his own boss while circumventing the Justice Department uh, to achieve a, a result for a client. Uh, and if uh, everything is, is copacetic and there's no difficulty with that, uh, based upon the policy that was written in the executive order in 1993, uh, then I do think it's an appropriate search for this committee to perhaps come up with a better revolving door uh, policy for both the executive branch and the legislative branch that perhaps makes the revolving door a little more difficult to revolve through uh, in as quickly a, a fashion. So I hope we do study that as well and perhaps can come up with some legislative solutions that um, if don't remove uh, impropriety, at least what is perceived by many, including myself, to be the appearance of impropriety. And I thank you and yield back. 
Thank you, Mr. Lottred. Uh, Mr. Cl Mr. Clay? You, you want to turn on your mic? Turn on your mic, Mr. Clay. As a newly elected member of Congress and a new member of this committee, I am pleased to be here today uh, for our first full committee meeting. Uh, while I can appreciate the fact that our committee has chosen to, to be the focal point for the examination of the pardon process, I am struck by the fact that the United States Constitution grants the President the absolute and unlimited power to grant commutations and pardons. And this pardon power is not subject to any restrictions by Congress. The President's power is at his sole discretion, and he is not required to follow federal regulations or procedure for pardon process. And so while some may disagree with the judgment made to pardon Mark Rich, we have no standing to interfere with or, or alter the underlying presidential authority. As to allegations that the pardon was the result of campaign contributions or influence peddling, it must be noted that there is cur currently no evidence or nexus to support such. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Clay. If there is no further discussion, uh, let me just make one uh, brief comment. What do you say? We, we uh, will be joined by Ms. Jackson Lee, who said she may have a few questions, uh, and we in the past have tried to accommodate non-members of the committee. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Asa Hutchinson here, too. Uh, so we have a, a, a long schedule today, but if they do have questions at the end of the five-minute round, first round, we'll, we'll try to accommodate them. Uh, do we have any further uh, comments? Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, let, let me just say, I don't think we have had a, uh, that th certainly the President's power here uh, to, to, to pardon is something that we can't overturn. I don't think anybody, but we have a, and anybody assumes we can do that. Uh, but we do have, I think, oversight responsibility in a case like this. And the fact of the matter is, from the ex-wife, there was furniture in several thousand dollars worth of furniture given to uh, uh, the, the President. There was huge campaign contributions. Whether there is a linkage or not, we have a responsibility, I think, to act and look at that in a pardon that I don't think any of the uh, law enforcement agencies that have examined this uh, have seen any merit in this at all. At one point, uh, $100 million was offered to settle this uh, and the Justice Department had uh, turned it down. Um, so I, I think we have a responsibility to look at this, to understand what happened. Maybe we can learn from this. Maybe there will be legal changes as a result of this. Uh, but I don't think anybody's talking about overturning it, but oversight responsibility, uh, we, we have it, and I think we need to use it in this particular case. Thank the gentleman from Virginia. Any further comments? If not, uh, would the three witnesses please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Be seated. Mr. Quinn has asked if he could uh, give a, a, a little longer opening statement. Uh, because of the gravity of the uh, hearing and the situation, we have no objection to that. Mr. Quinn will try to accommodate you, as well as uh, Mr. Weinberg and Mr. Auerbach. So, Mr. Quinn, you're recognized. Could, could you pull the microphone uh, close to you? Because sometimes these mics don't pick it up. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Okay. You, you don't have to get right up against it, but, uh, but it, you know. Uh, Chairman Burton, Representative Waxman, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide information about the pardon of Mark Rich. During the past several weeks, America has heard the voices of a great many people who disagree with this pardon. Probably all of you are among those who have expressed their disagreement or disappointment. I am well aware that I have a near impossible challenge today in trying to convince you of the merits of the pardon, but I do welcome the opportunity to sit before you and to answer your questions about the case that I made and the process I followed. I acted here as a lawyer who believes in the merits of the case that I made. I acted as a lawyer 
who vigorously and ethically pursued my client's interests as I'm required to do under the canons of ethics. And I acted as a lawyer who followed a process that included, not excluded, the United States Department of Justice. I took on Mark Rich as a client nearly two years ago. After careful review of his case and in the belief that in the American legal system, any person accused of wrongdoing is entitled to representation by a lawyer who advocates his position honestly, ethically, and conscientiously. That is what I did. Nothing more and nothing less. I appreciate the responsibilities of this committee. And while I agree with President Bush that a president's constitutional right to grant pardons is unfettered, and that the Congress cannot impose its own process on that prerogative, I also appreciate that it is helpful to your oversight responsibilities to understand as best as I can help you understand what happened in this particular case. In that regard, I have cooperated with you, consistent with my ethical obligations to my client, by providing information and documents and I assure you, I will continue to be cooperative and as helpful as I can be. I want to emphasize at the outset that the process I followed was one of transparency at both the Department of Justice and the White House. In filing my pardon petition, I included in this big document the views of the prosecutors, most particularly in the form of the indictment that they lodged against my client. On more than one occasion, I urged the White House counsel to seek the views of the Justice Department. I did so because I thought that was the professional way to proceed and because I had worked with Deputy Attorney General Holder in the past, I had and continue to have enormous respect for him and for his legal judgment and I was confident that before any decision was made on this matter, his views, and perhaps those of others at the Justice Department, would be sought. In point of fact, I believed the consultation by the White House with Mr. Holder would help me make my case. Because for over a year, since October of 1999, I had had a series of communications, orally and in writing, with him about Mr. Rich's case. I knew that he was familiar with the allegations in the indictment, and I had taken pains to familiarize him with the case we put together disputing the allegations in the indictment. But most importantly, what I hoped he could convey to the White House was the sense that Mark Rich and his lawyers were at an absolute impasse with the Southern District, and that this matter could not and would not be resolved short of a process such as a pardon. As I think you know by now, I personally notified Mr. Holder in his office on November 21st, 2000, that I would be sending a pardon application to the White House. I told him then that I hoped I could encourage the White House to seek his views, and he said I should do so. I then delivered this two-inch thick pardon application to the White House on December, December 11th more than five weeks before the pardon was granted. While the application was under consideration, I wrote to Mr. Holder on January 10th of this year and asked him to weigh in at the White House, expressing the hope that he would support my application. I hoped for his support. I didn't know whether he, it would be forthcoming or not, but I hoped he would support it. Still later, I called Mr. Holder on the night of January 19th. I told him that the rich pardon application was receiving serious consideration at the White House and that I understood that he would be contacted before a decision was made. I understand from him and from the former White House counsel, Beth Nolan, and from the former president that Mr. Holder was indeed consulted I believe that the views he expressed in that consultation were significant to the decision that was made. The process this pardon followed gave the President 
the time and the opportunity to weigh his decision carefully. For over five weeks, the White House had time to consider the views of White House attorneys, the Justice Department, and anyone else with whom it might choose to discuss the matter in order to make a judgment on the merits. As to the merits, you have before you my pardon application. And I understand that the gentlemen to my left disagree with me strenuously about this. But I remain to this day absolutely and unshakably convinced that the prosecutors constructed a legal house of cards in this indictment. At the heart of this case is a tax charge that I do believe is meritless. That tax charge formed the basis for attendant fraud charges, and that in turn formed the basis for one of the very first uses in a case of this kind of the federal racketeering statute. A use, by the way, which you should know the Department of Justice uh, does not condone any further. It was this misuse, I believe, of RICO on top of the misuse of RICO predicates and underlying all of it, a tax and energy case that I think did not have merit that made this indictment wanting. The case was fundamentally flawed. I believe that and I argued that. I argued it first with the Southern District. I attempted to persuade main justice here in Washington and the Southern District to consider the arguments we made on the law and to reopen discussions with us representing Mr. Rich. That conversation and other contacts that I had with the Department of Justice are reflected in the documents that I have provided to the committee and they are summarized in Appendix B to my testimony. My notes of November 8, 1999 reflect a telephone conversation in which I was told that some senior Department of Justice officials thought that the refusal of the prosecutors in New York to meet with Mr. Rich's attorneys was ill-considered and, in fact, ridiculous. Subsequently, I was told that senior officials, some senior officials at the Department of Justice had come to believe that the equities were on our side. Nevertheless, the prosecutors from the Southern District refused to discuss the case with us. And given this intractable impasse, we decided in October of this year to seek a pardon. I decided to fi file the pardon application directly to the White House because I knew that pardons are sometimes initiated at the White House and not at the Department of Justice. I would point out to you that in today's Los Angeles Times, it's reported that some 47 of these applications were initiated at the White House uh, without going through any process at the Department of Justice. Uh, as Mr. Waxman indicated earlier, that was true not just in this administration, but it has happened in previous administrations. But to be sure, I was confident that at some point the White House would consult with the Department of Justice. And based on the earlier conversations I had had throughout the course of a year, I believed that the Deputy Attorney General would not necessarily endorse a pardon, but I believed that he would at least confirm that we had reached an unresolvable stalemate with the Southern District. Now, as has been stated here by several of the members, the Constitution grants the pardon authority only to the President, not to the pardon attorney, not to the Deputy Attorney General, and not to the White House Counsel. Indeed, the pardon attorney reports to the Deputy Attorney General. And one of the major functions of the Deputy Attorney General is to serve as the departmental liaison with the White House staff and the Executive Office of the President, including specifically with respect to pardons. I informed that official of my petition. I encouraged the White House counsel to seek the views of that official. 
I did this over a period of two months, having briefed him about the case for more than a year before that. President Clinton properly gave serious consideration to Mr. Rich's pardon application. In my discussion with him about this application, we talked about the case and the law and nothing else. President Clinton, in that conversation, demanded that Mr. Rich waive all procedural defenses related to the transactions in question so that he could be potentially subject to civil penalties such as those faced by others who were involved in similar transactions and went through civil enforcement proceedings with the Department of Energy. That, this case should have been handled that way years ago. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, while you may disagree with the President's decision, I believe the facts establish that I represented my client's interest fairly, vigorously, and ethically. I carried out this representation, keeping both the Department of Justice and the White House informed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quinn and Mr. Weinberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, other members of the committee, uh, my name is uh, Morris Sandy Weinberg. Uh, I served as an assistant United States attorney from 1979 to 1985 in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District uh, of New York. And from approximately December of 1981, when I started the investigation against Mark Rich, until October of 1984, when his companies pled guilty uh, to, between them, 70-plus counts of um, uh, various federal felonies and tax evasion and paid the United States a couple of hundred million dollars, uh, I was the lead prosecutor on the Mark Rich case. With me today is Martin Auerbach, who was also an assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the Southern District of New York, and for the last year or so of that investigation helped me and worked with me uh, on the case. Between us, I think that we are the two most knowledgeable people from the prosecution side uh, uh, about the Mark Rich investigation. Uh, both of us are, have been for many years uh, white-collar criminal defense lawyers. Uh, I practice in Tampa. Mr. Albrecht practices in New York City. I'm with a Washington-based large law firm, Zuckerman Spader. And for many years, I have represented, like Mr. Quinn has and others, people that are under investigation or been indicted by the United States. I might also add, Your Honor, that I am, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I, I am um, uh, not here today to do, it, to, to, to do several things. Although I have very strong, as you will see, disagreements uh, with what Mr. Quinn has said about the merits, or in his view, the lack of merits of the case, I am not here today to question Mr. Quinn's motives with regard to uh, this pardon and this pardon application. I've represented many people. I understand what it is to represent people. I understand that when one does it, one has to characterize the facts in the light most favorable to your client. I understand that. I'm also, Your Honor, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, as, uh, along with Mr. Auerbach, as a lifelong Democrat, uh, we are not here for any political purpose. We, are not, we have no political motives in this case. I grew up in Tennessee. I've been a Democrat my entire life. Uh, I'm not here for that purpose. We are here, I am here, uh, to, talk about, uh, to talk about why, in my opinion, uh, to talk about my outrage, uh, basically because um, because we feel this outrage we have is seated in, in our intimate knowledge of the facts of this investigation and the facts of this case. Um, we are here today at, upon your invitation, and we appreciate it, to provide some background regarding the prosecution of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green. Um, in particular, we are here to express our outrage at the pardons of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green who for the past 17 years have been international fugitives in what is the biggest tax fraud case in the history of the United States. As international fugitives who renounced their American citizenship in 1983 
for the specific purpose of avoiding extradition on these charges. We do not believe that Mr. Rich or Mr. Green should have been candidates for pardon. We are particularly distressed because despite what Mr. Quinn has said today, it appears that the President received no input from anyone who had any knowledge of the particulars of this prosecution from the prosecution side. It is my belief and understanding that no one from the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York was contacted, no one from the IRS, the agents, from the FBI. Certainly I was not contacted, Mr. Auerbach was not contacted, and I have been contacted over the years every time another lawyer or law firm has come in to try to negotiate a resolution. I have always been contacted by the Southern District to receive my input. None of that happened, apparently, uh, in this case. Not surprisingly, this application for pardon is a one-sided account. You know, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an advocate's piece. It, it's a, I've done uh, advocate pieces like this over the last 15 years. Um, but in our opinion, it wholly and completely mischaracterizes the circumstances and facts surrounding the Mark Rich case. If either of us had been given an opportunity to, had been given the opportunity, we would have told President Clinton about the actual facts of this investigation, the actual facts of the prosecution, what this prosecution was really about, and why it had so much merit, and why there were probably two no more unsuited people for a presidential pardon than Mark Rich and Pincus Green, and why, in our opinion, this pardon was so unwarranted. The pardon application itself, and Mr. Quinn's uh, remarks and his prepared remarks and his remarks today and what I've heard him say on television demonstrate, I believe, an utter lack of contrition and remorse uh, on the part of Mr. Green and Mr. Rich for their criminal conduct, for their renunciation of their United States citizenship, for the fact that they, they fled uh, justice 17 years ago. Instead, the pardon application states that Mr. Rich, Mr. Green, and their companies, which incidentally pled guilty with, with some of the best counsel in the United States in 1984, it says, quote, that Mr. Rich, Mr. Green, and their companies are, are, um, have, were wrongfully indicted nearly 20 years ago, have complete defenses to the indictment, are victims of an injustice, have had an unfair and unwarranted treatment. It alleges that Mr. Green and Mr. Rich were somehow, quote, singled out and prosecuted for, quote, mere civil offenses, and that they have suffered terrible hardships in their 20 years of fugitivity in, in Switzerland as a result of this prosecution. It dismisses wholly the fact that in 1984, uh, Mr. Rich's two companies pled guilty to all those counts and paid $200 million worth of fines by merely suggesting, according to the application, that the pleas were, were the result of government overreaching and a business decision to save the companies. Now, while the philanthropy of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green over the past 20 years is admirable, it does not erase, in my opinion, or Mr. Auerbach's opinion, the gravity of their criminal conduct or the importance of the prosecution then and a prosecution now. As, sort, as set forth below, the prosecution was based on numerous witnesses from, with, from within Mark Rich's companies, current employees and former employees. People to the level of the CFO were, were witnesses in this case, as, w as well as witnesses from third-party companies that were co-conspirators in these crimes. It was the overwhelming nature of the evidence, in my opinion, that caused Mr. Rich and Mr. Green to flee 17 years ago. It was not, as Mr. Quinn says, a, uh, a legal house of cards or a meritless prosecution or a civil case, because surely uh, Mr. Rich and Mr. Green, who were represented by Edward Bennett Williams, you know, that wonderful lawyer, my opinion, the greatest lawyer of his time, surely. Uh, Mr. Rich and Mr. Green would not have fled 
would not have risked so much, would not have under, undergone all of the obstruction that happened during that investigation that made the case so famous. Surely that they would not have paid $200 million and had their companies plead to a meritless case. Surely they would have not, not done that if they had an absolute defense to the case and they believed that back in 1983 or 1984. It would have been nice in 1983 or 1984 if Mr. Williams or many or any of the other lawyers that was representing Mark Rich, Pincus Green and their companies had come to us and said, Sandy or Martin or, or um, John Martin, who was the U.S. attorney through, through most of this, this case is, in our opinion, just a civil case. It's meritless. You got it all wrong. There's a Swiss tax treaty. We, 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 we had advice of counsel. None of those arguments were raised in 1983 and 1984. And are now, and were raised only after uh, the case was over. They had pled $200 million. They had fled the jurisdiction, and then they were trying to come in 10 years later, 15 years later, and, and in my opinion, you know, buy their way out of ever having to face the merits of the case by saying that the case was, you know, had no merit. Uh, that isn't the way that, that the judicial system is supposed to work. You know, how can Mr. Quinn say that, that um, in, in 2001, Mark Rich and Pincus Green wouldn't have gotten a fair trial in the Southern District of New York? He's certainly not suggesting that one of the many judges there wouldn't have given them a fair trial. I mean, if this case was so meritless, why didn't they come back? Why didn't they face the charges? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that they didn't come back because they knew that the charges were, were so overwhelming, in my opinion. But it's even worse than that. Um, the, the evidence is as strong today, in our opinion, as it was 17 years ago. In 1984, and, I, and I, I've forgotten a lot of things in the last 20 years, and I, and I, I got sent the, um, the minutes from the plea that took place in 1984. And I was standing in court uh, with uh, Peter Fleming, one of the wonderful lawyers that was representing Mark Rich, and Peter Zimroth, another terrific lawyer that was representing Mark Rich. And the companies were, were pleading guilty that day. And there were more people in the room than there are today because it, it was a historic plea. It was a very big plea, the biggest resolution at the time ever. And those lawyers stood in court that day, in federal court, in front of a federal judge, and, and they entered, in behalf of the two companies, guilty pleas to 38 counts in behalf of Mark Rich Company AG and 40 felony counts in behalf of Mark Rich Company International. And they stood there and they told the federal judge that the pleas were voluntary. That's what the lawyer said. That's what the transcript says. And that they were not the result of any threats or extortion. And they told the federal judge that Mark Rich's company in the United States had hidden in their words when they were making the allocution is what they call it, when they were telling the judge what the companies had done wrong. Uh, they, they, they told the federal judge that Mark Rich's company in the United States had hidden millions of dollars of income from crude oil transactions, had hidden it from the IRS, had hidden it from the Department of Energy, had, had evaded millions of dollars in taxes and had filed numerous false documents with the Department of Energy with regard to the income which was illegal. In addition, they paid $200 million in taxes and penalties. And if the case was so weak, I mean, what in the world were those lawyers thinking at that time? Um, as described in the pardon application. They would have never pled guilty. They would have never paid those fines. Whatever the reason for the pardon, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and the members of the committee, Whatever the reason, surely the reason was not the merits of the case. Because this case, you know, had, in my opinion, and I believe in the opinion of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green who fled, and the opinion of their lawyers who, who allowed the, the guilty pleas to, 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 uh, to go down and who, who told the federal judge that they had in fact committed those crimes. I mean, the fact of the matter is the case was full of merit and it is just, I believe, incredible that 20 years later I'm sitting here and hearing that the case was without merit and it was a legal house of cards. Um, uh, I am not going to read um, the details uh, of my testimony, which I understand is here about the investigation, but I'll just summarize a few things. The reason, in my opinion, that, that um, uh, Mr. Quinn has said and others have said um, in the application that there was a hysteria that grew up around the case and that somehow I, who I think was 31 at the time, um, and other prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, were, were, were creating a media event. The case was an important case to begin with. It was the biggest tax fraud in, in the history of the United States. 
but it was like any other case until Mr. Rich and Mr. Green began to attempt to obstruct the investigation during the investigation stage. And a series of events happened that made it such a famous case. It started with um, us subpoenaing uh, Mark Rich's Swiss records. And it was, it, it, it was, it, it set jurisdictional precedent. And we took the position that we had jurisdiction in the United States over, Swiss, over a Swiss company. And we litigated that. Everything in this case was litigated to the hill. We litigated it. We went to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And we won. And, and the, the, the judge on this case was Leonard Sand, who is the judge today that's trying the, the, um, um, the uh, Osama bin Laden case in, in, um, in, in New York, as we sit here today. He's, he's a terrific federal judge. And he ruled we had jurisdiction. He ruled the court should, that the company should turn over the documents. And the company um, refused to turn over the documents. So he, he found the companies in contempt and, and, and ordered a $50,000 a day fine, which at the time was, was, I think, the biggest fine ever. And the lawyers for the company told um, Ms., uh, Judge Sand, we're not going to pay the fine and we're not going to turn over the documents. So that was story number one. That was, that was a front page story and it ran forever as the, the press was following the $50,000 a day, $50, a day fine. And then, on, right on top of that, it turned out, we, we, we discovered that Mark Rich had, had attempted to secretly sell his only U.S. asset, which was this, which, uh, which was this, um, uh, which was this American subsidiary. And, and when we found out about that, we went to the court, and the court determined, in the court's opinion, that it was a fraudulent attempt to, to, to uh, keep assets you know, out, of, of the, uh, out of our control and to avoid paying the $50,000 a day fine. And ultimately, the Second Circuit ruled that it was fraudulent and even found that, that, that the attorney-client privilege on, on the crime fraud exception was, was dispensed with and that we were able to talk to the attorneys for Mark Rich about the sale and found out how fraudulent it, it was. And, and when the fines began to accumulate, and, and these were all being reported on a, on a regular basis, when the fines began to accumulate, uh, we, we negotiated a deal uh, with, with the companies to turn over the records and pay the fines up to date. And we, we inked that in Judge Sand's apartment one Friday night. And we, I thought it was over with and that, that we would go with the investigation. And four days later, we got a tip from somebody in Mark Rich's New York office that they were smuggling documents out of the country, subpoenaed documents out of the country in steamer trunks. And we reeled a Swiss Air flight in from, from, from the runway. And there were two steamer trunks, and they were unmarked, and they were chock full of subpoenaed records. And that was a steamer trunk affair. And that was another front, you know, front page story. And then, and then, you know, and then the, and then the indictment proceeded, and there was, and there was an, an enormous amount of attention from the indictment. And then Mr. Rich and Mr. Green became fugitives. And all of these things made the case, you know, an internationally reported case. But it was their conduct, not our conduct, that, that you know, that, uh, that, that, that was being reported uh, at the time. Um, we, when we finalized our investigation um, after the indictment, the companies vigorously litigated the charges. They filed dozens of pretrial motions, hundreds of pages of legal briefs. They raised every conceivable defense except the defense that we're hearing now. Um, 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 they never argued that it wasn't taxable income, that, that it did not ca constitute tax evasion, and never argued that they had, had advice of counsel. And then there was plea negotiations uh, with the companies when it became clear that the individuals weren't coming back. We sought to extradite them. The Swiss government wouldn't extradite them. And we ended up um, accepting guilty pleas fr um, from the companies. And as I close, in my opinion, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the case against Mr. Rich and Mr. Green was very strong and continues to be very strong. The government would have called witnesses from Mark Rich's companies who would have detailed, who would have described in detail the huge tax fraud and energy fraud scheme. Like any fraud case, anyone I've ever participated in as a prosecutor or a defense lawyer, the evidence was rife with false documents, inflated invoices, sham transactions, off the record, off the book deals. The conspirators in this case kept track of the legal profits, the illegal profits, which was about $100 million, 
in handwritten journals in what was described by themselves and on these journals as the pot. As alleged in the indictment, the evidence included meetings between these co-conspirators and Mark Rich regarding the pots and the scheme to funnel the illegal profits out of the country to offshore accounts. In addition, Mr. Green and Mr. Rich's fugitive status was further evidence of their consciousness of guilt. Now, 17 years later, the pardon application asserts that the acts alleged were civil, not criminal, and that the conduct to which the companies pled guilty and for which Mr. Rich and Mr. Green were indicted was perfectly innocent intercompany transactions protected by a U.S.-Swiss tax treaty. If the transactions were considered legitimate at the time, one wonders why it was necessary to create the pots, use inflated invoices, use sham transactions to funnel the profits out of the United States. And as I said before, it's unlikely with the best defense lawyers in America that Mark Rich and Pinkett's Green would have risked everything to become fugitives if it was just a civil misunderstanding. In truth, Mr. Rich and Mr. Green, in my opinion, have forfeited their right to question the merits of this case in their pardon application by, by becoming fugitives, by renouncing their citizenship, by having their companies plead guilty to the scheme 17 years ago. Whatever the debate about their pardons, it should not, and I agree with, with, with what the Congressman should say, has said, it should not, the debate should not be over the merits of the case against them. Those merits were clear then, they are clear today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. That was uh, very thorough. Mr. Auerbach. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Waxman, distinguished members of the committee, I come today to express the outrage I share with Mr. Weinberg and I believe with many other Americans over President Clinton's pardon of Mark Rich and Pincus Green. Mr. Quinn has suggested to the committee and to the nation that we had a legal house of cards. Well, if we did, it was all aces. We had extraordinary testimony, extraordinary cooperation from people within Mark Rich's organization, which demonstrated the guilt to which his companies pleaded guilty. The notion that this pardon was, quote, on the merits, as has been said by our former president, a man who I voted for twice, uh, is simply incorrect. The merits of this case were unquestionably in the government's favor. Mr. Quinn has said that in presenting the pardon application, he presented the views of the prosecutors. But when one reads the pardon application, one sees the indictment, which does express the charges, but does not set forth the facts. One of the linchpins of the attack on the case is an analysis that was done 10 years ago by two very distinguished tax professors and was presented to the United States Attorney's Office in December 1990, directed to a distinguished prosecutor who went on to become himself a professor at Columbia Law School and now, with the advice and consent of the United States Senate, sits on the federal bench in New York. The transmittal letter that came with that analysis says it all and betrays the problem, the fundamental flaw in the pardon application as it was applied to Mr. Rich and Mr. Green. And that is a complete absence of a knowledge of the facts, the true facts of this case, the facts that led the companies to plead guilty. When that analysis was sent 10 years ago, the professors who wrote it said, quote, and this is in tab C to the pardon application, quote, making no independent verification of the facts, but accepting the statements thereof made to us by Mr. Rich and Mr. Green's lawyers. And that's the problem. The president relied on the facts as described to him by Mr. Rich and Mr. Green's lawyers making no independent investigation. Since 1983, when I began working on this case, I have had numerous conversations, both as a prosecutor and after leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office, about the merits of this case. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green reached an impasse with the U.S. Attorney's Office 
not because the U.S. Attorney's Office was unreasonable and was unwilling to listen to their arguments and analysis. They reached an impasse because of the facts. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green are commodities traders. By its nature, that is a gambling profession. And there's an old song about the gambler, which says you have to know when to hold, know when to fold up, know when to walk away, know when to run. And they ran, and they ran because of the facts. And they couldn't come back because of the facts. And it was only by circumventing a process that they had gone through years and years and years ago and continued to go through, a process which involved a careful consideration of their arguments against the facts of the case that allowed them to come back. Now, the one card we did not have was the get out of jail free card. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green now have that card. And I believe that one of the functions that this committee can perform is not only the function of looking at the presidential pardon process and encouraging the current president and all presidents who follow him to never again make the mistake, for whatever reason it was made, by Mr. Clinton in pardoning fugitives who have turned their back on the United States, who have engaged in conduct pleaded guilty to by their companies that constituted thumbing their noses at American laws at times of crisis, the energy crisis. In 1973 and 1974, I had the privilege of working for the House Commerce Committee. And I will never forget the hearings that were held with respect to the energy crisis. It was a crisis of great proportion for the American people. A response was crafted by government perhaps an imperfect response, but a real response. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green chose to evade the law with respect to those controls. They chose to make illegal profits at a time when Americans were suffering under extraordinarily high energy prices. When we had a hostage crisis in Iran, we attempted to respond to that by having legislation and regulation. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green, as alleged in the indictment, chose to put their personal profits ahead of the needs and the laws of the United States. The notion that a president of the United States in the future might make the same mistake and act on a pardon application that may reflect the prosecutor's views but not present to him the facts is a mistake that I would urge this committee to ensure never happens again. The other thing I would ask this committee to do in its oversight function is to look to the future. Mr. Rich and Mr. Green announced long ago that they had renounced their citizenship. We took the position that they were still citizens of the United States, still subject to our jurisdiction and extradition. But they took the position that they were citizens of the world. If they, in fact, renounced their citizenships and are no longer Americans, then I believe they have no absolute right to return to this country. And I think that this committee should call upon the State Department and the White House to consider whether Mr. Rich and Mr. Green are welcome in America, or whether their complete contempt for the laws of the United States and for the courts of the United States, as reflected in the conduct that Mr. Weinberg described, which led them to pay $21 million in contempt fines, fines they preferred to pay rather than produce documents and I believe that if those documents had demonstrated their innocence, those documents would have been on our doorstep before we asked for them. I believe that we have to look at their contempt and say, if you are not American citizens and have no right to be here, you are not welcome here. Alternatively, if they are United States citizens, free to come and go as they please, then we have to look at their civil liabilities. Mr. Quinn wrote to the President saying that Mr. Rich and Mr. Green would waive all the procedural obstacles to the government pursuing them with respect to civil liabilities arising from the transactions for which they were indicted. That, Mr. Chairman, is a completely hollow promise. It is utterly meaningless. It is less than ice in winter. It is an empty glass. The civil liabilities in this case were fully extinguished in 1984 when Mark Rich & Co. AG and Mark Rich & Co. International Limited paid $150 million to the United States government. The civil liabilities were corporate civil liabilities. We have been accused of being reckless and overreaching. We did not 
charge Mark Rich and Co. AG with tax evasion because it was not a U.S. taxpayer. We did pay Mark, we did charge Mark Rich and Co. International Limited with tax evasion. It pleaded guilty and it satisfied its tax liabilities. That civil liability is gone. With respect to the Energy Department and the energy regulations, that civil liability is gone. That was never an individual liability of theirs. It was a corporate liability. Their liability was a criminal liability. And so I would ask the committee to ensure that if they are welcome to return to the United States, that we do everything in our power to hold them responsible for any liabilities they may have, including, of course, tax liability for the past 17 years. It is my impression, perhaps incorrect, but I believe not, that for the past 17 years they have taken the position that they are not United States citizens and need not pay United States income tax. During that period, as one of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green's lawyers informed me several years ago, they went from owning the second largest commodities trading company in the world to owning the largest commodities trading company in the world, which Mr. Rich and Mr. Green proceeded to sell at enormous personal profit. If they made such profits and have not paid their taxes, I hope this committee will ensure that they do so. One last thing I would say. When you make a deal with the devil, you ought to get paid. I don't know what the deal was or whether there was a deal that led to Mr. Rich's and Mr. Green's pardon. I see the fingerprints of Mr. Rich and Mr. Green in the way that this was approached because in the course of our investigation, in the course of watching his conduct over the years, I have come to understand the way Mr. Rich and Mr. Green do business and why they have been such phenomenally successful commodities traders. They do information arbitrage. They take advantage of the fact that the guy on the other side of the table doesn't know what they do. It happened here again. They take advantage of building special relationships with people in government, which they can then exploit, sometimes at the cost of those people's own allegiance to their true employers. I'm not suggesting that Mr. Quinn is anything other than a deeply loyal American. I believe we all are. But I am suggesting that Mr. Rich and Mr. Green exploited one of the techniques that made them so successful and so rich. If, in fact, one of the compelling parts of the pardon application was the charity that they have bestowed. And I assure you that at the time they were indicted, we were aware that particularly Mr. Green was an extremely charitable person. Mr. Green is a deeply observant religious man. His religious beliefs preclude him from making money between sundown on Friday and sundown on Saturday. And so he chose to have his profits go into a charitable trust for that period. I applaud that. I think that is wonderful. But I do not believe that the $220 million of charity that is reflected in this pardon application wipes out their guilt. What it does suggest, however, is that if we have made a deal with the devil, there is a good way for him to pay. Not only should the tax liabilities, if they are American citizens, be fully satisfied, but I call on them both to increase their charity. They offered to pay $100 million to settle these matters. I call upon them, I call upon this committee, I call upon the Congress and the people of the United States to say to them, now prove that you are truly charitable men. Prove that you are not looking, that you are not simply looking for a way to buy yourself back into somebody's heart. Put up the money now. If you don't owe the civil liabilities that Mr. Quinn was prepared to have you satisfy, establish charitable foundations. Put that money on the table now so that at least the American people can receive some benefit from the extraordinary wealth that you achieved by turning your back on American law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Auerbach. Uh, it's a very interesting testimony. Uh, we will now go to the uh, uh, to the 30 minutes on each side, uh, Mr. Shays, uh, we'll recognize you for uh, the first 10 minutes on our side. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, this committee, the Government Reform Committee and the Government Affairs Committee in the Senate has had approximately 80 people refuse to testify before this committee 
uh, exercising their Fifth Amendment rights. And now Denise Rich is just one more person added to that number. And uh, Mr. Quinn, I may have a lot of feelings about what you did, but I think it takes a lot of guts to be here, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you. There are some who believe, and I am one of them, that former President Clinton appears to have pardoned two traitors to their country and our country. And uh, I want to just deal with the part of the indictment that people refer to as trading with the enemy. Mr. Quinn, you claimed in the pardon application that the Southern District of New York dropped the trading with the enemy charges against Mr. Rich's companies because they somehow lacked merit. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Quinn, you argued in your petition for pardon that because the trading with the enemy charges against the company were dropped, the charges against Messrs. Rich and Green should have been dropped also. Is that correct? Well, the, the central uh, argument on this point, sir, is that the regulations in question do not reach individuals who are engaged in such trading on corporations. Is it your position that your clients did not trade with Iran or that it was not illegal if they did? The latter. That it was not illegal if they did? That's correct. Did the, they trade that, with Iran? It is my understanding that there was such trading, but that it was on behalf of foreign corporations, and that that being the case, the regulations in question did not reach that conduct. Mr. Weinberg, could you explain why the charges against the company for trading with Iran were dropped? Uh, yes. We, when Mr. Rich and Mr. Green became fugitives, we were left with trying a case against two corporations and a third individual who was a principal of this uh, company called Listo. His name was Clyde Meltzer. By the way, he did not get a pardon, even though he ended up uh, being the one person that pled guilty uh, in this case. But because Mr. Meltzer was not involved in any of the trading with the enemy charges, it created a real problem uh, for trying the case without, the without Mark Rich and Pincus Green there, because Mr. Meltzer took the position that he was entitled to a severance and there would have to be two trials. And so in order to avoid having two trials, we, we superseded the indictment and took the trading with the enemy counts out of the, the RICO charges they applied to, um, to the companies and, and uh, dismissed them as to the companies and told the court that uh, if we tried this case, uh, we would not have those counts that Mr. Meltzer believed were so inflammatory to him that it would, he would not get a fair trial. But we also made it clear that the charges would remain outstanding as to the individuals. And just in response to what Mr. Quinn said, it, we, we charged that these, these trades were made by Mr. Rich and Mr. Green from their New York office. I mean, that's what the indictment charges, and that's what the proof would have been. And that, and that um, um, we were very confident that the United States laws and regulations prohibited Americans from, from making deals and for, regardless of whether, whether the deal was for their Swiss company or their American company, but they couldn't in the, in the United States make deals that caused uh, U.S. money to go from U.S. banks to the Iranians, uh, which in this case we would have proven, I believe. So, so we felt strongly about the charges. Uh, we dismissed them as to the company because we wanted to uh, have one trial and not two. So it's your testimony that you certainly wouldn't have dropped it as it related to the individuals? No, it really applied more to the individuals because it was the individuals in this case that were American citizens. It was the individuals in this case that actually did the deals. It was the individuals that, that uh, were the, you know, had, had violated, you know, the, the, um, the trading with the enemy counts. Mr. Chase, Mr. May, yes. may I add one? Sure. Um, as you can see, um, and as I hope you will see through the course of this hearing, on this and a number of other points, we disagree. Um, I do not believe that those regulations reach this conduct. I want, and, and I'm going to try in the course of this hearing to comment on as many of the harsh things said by these gentlemen um, as I can. Um, but I do want to single out one particular aspect of this, and that is this, the fact that um, this gentleman renounced his U.S. citizenship. 
And you know, I'd like to come back to that. I, we'll, we'll come back to it, you know, to, unless it relates directly to this point. Well, it's going to be a simple point. Okay. And, and, uh, I want to be clear that I did not recommend he do that. I would never recommend that any American do that. I do not condone that, but I want you to know that I do not think that that fact was pertinent to the charges against him. Okay. This is a, a fugitive from justice who was a U.S. citizen who then left after being prosecuted, renounces his U.S. citizenship. Well. But let me just go on. Uh, during the last 20 years, did Mark Rich or his companies trade with Gaddafi or Libya? Mr. I don't Quinn. know the answer to that, sir. Uh, uh, should it make any difference to you if he did? The pardon application goes to the legal merit or lack of merit of the indictment. I did not act here as a character witness for these people. I took on the indictment within its four corners. I only have 10 minutes, so, so I'd like you to be precise here. I'm saying should it have made any difference? The answer is yes or no. Uh, um, I think not. Did you try to find out whether he did? No, because I had no information that it might have been the case. Did Mr. Rich trade with Iran when U.S. hostages were being held captive? I do not know the precise answer to that question. It is my belief that he uh, traded with Iran. I can't tell you right now when that occurred. Should it make any difference to you if he did? Again, um, I approach this as a lawyer concerned with the indictment that was before me and whether or not it should stand. Um, I was not here to be a character witness. I was here to take on... Okay, it didn't make any difference indictment. to you. Should it have made a difference to the President of the United States? Um, it, it's something he well may uh, have taken into consideration, certainly. I mean, the President in... Uh, in, the, in the last 12 years, did Mark Rich or any of his companies trade embargo, uh, excuse me, did they uh, trade with Iraq, with Iraqi I, oil? I, I don't know the answer to that. Should it make any difference to you if it was, this was true? If it didn't go to the, the allegations of this indictment, uh, it would not, in my view, have undermined the legal case we made against the indictment. Did you try to find out if it did? If no, did? but again, because uh, so I... So the answer is no? That's no. correct. Right. And then, then the next question is, should it have made a difference to the President of the United States? I, and again, I think the President could and should take into consideration whatever information he chooses to take into consideration. I can speak only to the information I provided and to you him. You felt no obligation to tell the President whether Mark Rich and Mr. Green uh, may have traded with Libya, traded with Iran, or traded with Iraq, and you don't think you had any obligation to inform the President of that? Oh. I know what my obligation as a lawyer was. It was to argue this case forcefully. And by the way, um, I, as I think you know, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, whom one would expect to have been concerned if those sorts of uh, nefarious trade dealings uh, were underway, would not have been as vocal as he was in support of this pardon. During the trade embargo of South Africa during the days of apartheid, did Mark Rich or his companies trade with South African government? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, should it make any difference to you that he did? Um, it would not have made any uh, difference to whether or not this indictment had merit. Um, should it make a difference to the President of the United States? Again, I think the President could and should take into account whatever information he chose to. Do you know whether uh, Rich or his companies traded with Cuba? I do not. Were any of Mr. Rich's assets or any assets of his company frozen for illegal trading with Cuba? I don't know the answer to that. If, in fact, Mark Rich or Pincus Green were traitors to the United States, should they be pardoned? Um, with all due respect, uh, I think it's a, um, an unfair question because I did not believe that they were traitors. No, you said, you said that it wasn't part 
of your request and the pardon. You didn't say whether or not you believe that because you didn't check. You have an indictment trading with the enemy, uh, and you basically said that was irrelevant and shouldn't apply. I said that the charge was without merit because the regulations in question do not reach a situation in which individuals are trading on behalf of a non-U.S. company. A gen gentleman's time Thank has, you. has expired. Let, let, let me just real briefly make one comment, and that is that I think when a, when a, a pardon is looked at, uh, in addition to the charges brought against people like uh, uh, these gentlemen, uh, they ought to look at what they've done since then to see if there's any contrition. And uh, they did deal with those countries just mentioned during the embargoes. So there was no contrition whatsoever. They went on with the same modus, of, uh, operation, modus operandi that they had before. So there was no contrition, and I can't understand why that wasn't taken into consideration. I have one question. Mr. Chairman, that, may I just have you for one second to point real, out real briefly, that in the process they made a fortune. A fortune. And in the process they didn't declare those taxes. That's right. Uh, I just have one question, then I'll yield to my colleague, Mr. Latourette. If, uh, if these uh, gentlemen, Mr. Rich and Mr. Green, had a good case, why did they flee the country, and why did they try to smuggle subpoenaed documents out in steamer trunks that were only caught because there was a tip? Well, I mean, if, if there was no case, if this was a house of cards, why did they flee the country, and why did they try to smuggle subpoenaed documents out of the country? Um, let me answer you in several parts. Um, first of all, it is uh, my understanding that when they were indicted, they were outside the country. Secondly, what, what they did was fail to return to the country after the indictment. That is my understanding. Secondly, um, it is also my understanding that the United States government has never alleged that their absence is in and of itself unlawful. Thirdly, with regard to the documents, uh, what I have been told is that those documents were going to Switzerland for the purpose of being reviewed for privilege by the lawyers. Um, that is their answer, sir. Uh, I'm sure the counsel that was uh, involved in the prosecution would like to respond real briefly. Right. It, it was um, a couple of things, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, I would note that when you look at the pardon application, the f point one is not a discussion of the legal merits of this case, but of who these men are and why they're entitled to come back. It is not until you get to page 20 of the pardon application that you begin to reach a discussion of the merits of this case. With respect to the documents that were being slipped out of the country, the suggestion was never that those were being reviewed for attorney-client privilege. It was simply uh, that it would be more convenient for counsel to review them in Switzerland than to review them in New York. Now, we had tons and tons of documents delivered to us. These two steamer trunks were slipping out. We didn't get a call from them saying, you know, we've got some people over in Zug with nothing better to do than look at documents. Would you mind if we took some over there? Outside the jurisdiction at a time when we are in contempt for refusing to produce documents from Switzerland. Um, so when we get down to the merits of this case, I'm afraid Mr. Rich and Mr. Green do not win. Uh, and as far as fugitivity is concerned, very briefly, um, I think it's a distinction without a difference. They, they were indicted. They were, they were well aware of the investigation. There were negotiations on with Mr. Williams that have been reported uh, before the indictment, the $100 million offer. Uh, they chose not to come home. There were arrest warrants outstanding. Uh, they renounced their citizenship to avoid extradition. Uh, they became citizens of Bolivia uh, at the time. Uh, it, these are fugitives, and uh, I still believe that a fugitive that has renounced his citizenship is not, should not be at the top of the list of people that are considered for the ultimate act of mercy that the Constitution re re uh, reserves to the President, which is the pardon power. Thank you, Mr. Weinberg. Mr. Lotteret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, could I ask the, the Council how much time remains in our, our 30 minutes? Well, 
Because uh, I kind of interrupted there, uh, I think you have about seven and a half minutes. Okay. So I, does, uh, could I ask the council to notify me when we have ten left? Because I want my friend Mr. Barr to have a full ten minutes to explain what's on his and, mind. And I will yield my five minutes to you in the second round because I did I, take your time. I thank you very much. But Mr. Quinn, I want to uh, begin where uh, Mr. Weinberg just left off because there, there's a couple things about this that, that concern me and it has to do with definitions. And I, I mentioned in my opening remarks when, when we get to the second panel and you're joined by Mr. Holder, uh, I, I want to talk to you about some definitions that have been used in interpreting Executive Order 12834. Uh, but for this round, uh, I, I want to talk about the issue of fugitivity. Uh, apparently, as I understand the media accounts and, and other things, and maybe if you could refer to uh, exhibit number 15 in the committee's uh, uh, committee uh, hearing exhibits, apparently there was a conversation between you and Bruce Lindsay in Belfast, Ireland, and uh, one of the things that was of concern to the Clinton administration was the fact that somebody was telling them at least that uh, Mark Rich and, and Pincus Green were fugitives from justice. Uh, and in response to that uh, conversation, you apparently felt compelled to uh, send Mr. Lindsay at the White House a letter uh, on December the 19th uh, of 2000, and in, in particular you say, I want to follow up on an issue you raised in our conversation while in Belfast uh, on the subject uh, of the pardon for Mark Rich and Pinky Green. You expressed a concern that they're fugitives, and I told you that there's not. Uh, here's why. Uh, and Rich and Green were in fact residing in Switzerland when they were indicted in September 1983, and I think that that's what Mr. Weinberg uh, was just addressing, sort of the, the distinction uh, without a difference. And here's why it, it's troubling. Uh, we had a hearing uh, in this committee last year where we had a, uh, a former Cuban intelligence official and he explained to us that uh, it was his belief that Fidel Castro helped pay for and orchestrate the largest armored car robbery in the history of the United States. Seven million dollars uh, was taken. Uh, and then Fidel Castro, according to this witness, helped smuggle the person out of the United States and back to Cuba. And if we could go to uh, Exhibit 101 uh, in the committee's documents, uh, like your client, uh, he wound up on the top ten list uh, of those most wanted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, his name is Victor Manuel uh, Garena. Uh, and the conduct on that occasion was that he took two security employees hostage at gunpoint, handcuffed them, bound them, and injected them with an unknown substance to further disable them. However, the indictment for Mr. Garena wasn't issued until he was safely back in Cuba. Uh, now, if we take your definition of what a fugitive is in your letter to, to, uh, to Mr. Lindsay, uh, it would appear that the FBI has made another mistake by putting this fellow on the most wanted list because he's not a fugitive either. Now, now how, can, how can you say that that's the definition of fugitivity? Well, sir, the facts as stated in my letter are, I believe, accurate. It, it has not been my impression that uh, Mr. Weinberg or any other representative of the United States government um, alleged that their failure to return was itself criminal. And it, you and I are perhaps using different definitions of fugitivity, and I accept that. But I, I do not understand their absence to have been criminal. But, okay. I, and, and, and the purpose of my letter was to make that point. Uh, but apparently, I mean, again, as I read it, and I'll, I'll let Mr. Weinberg jump in here in a minute. I, I used to do this not as, as skilled as, as these fellows did. I used to be a, a simple county prosecutor. And, and I guess when I had a defendant that was facing 300 years, throwing in a, a fugitive from justice that carried a year and a half really didn't mean a whole lot to the guy. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, if we take your definition, and Bruce Lindsay seemed to be worried about the fact that you were asking a fugitive from justice to receive a presidential pardon, your answer to him is, hey, good news, Bruce, he's not a fugitive because he was already over in, in Switzerland. And I would assert to you that, that if uh, Marcus Gr or Mark Green wasn't a fugitive, then neither is Mr. Grena. Uh, we had a famous case here a couple of years ago where a fella fled to Pakistan a after murdering a, a CIA agent in the parking lot, and he, was, he wouldn't have been a fugitive. And, and the last observation, and maybe you can then Tell me what the difference is. Uh, Mr. Weinberg was talking about uh, you're not his first lawyer, Mr. Rich. He, he had uh, Edward Bennett Williams, a, a great, great lawyer, uh, 
Uh, and if we could just go to, they've written a, a biography about him when this case is mentioned, and if you could go to exhibit 102 maybe, um, the, the excerpt from Mr. Williams' biography reads that as follows, uh, Williams was standing in the office of Marvin Davis in Los Angeles when he heard the news that his client was on the lam. According to Davis, Williams shouted into the phone, you know something, Mark, you spit on the American flag. You spit on the jury system, whatever you get you deserve. You could have gotten the minimum, we could have gotten the minimum, now you're going to sink. Uh, it, it appears that one of Mr. Rich's former lawyers seemed to think that he was a fugitive from justice uh, and undeserving of any favorable treatment and certainly a pardon, I would suggest, by the American justice system. Uh, and I guess, how do you, how have you reached a, a different conclusion than, than Mr. Williams as to, uh, as to the fugitivity question? Um, well, again, sir, my position on fugitivity is laid out in that letter to Lindsay. Um, but to the point that I reached a different conclusion about this case than Mr. Williams did, um, I learned about this case in excruciating detail from such people as Lewis Libby, who is now Vice President Cheney's Chief of Staff. No, I, I understand your, your, your argument on the merits, but, uh, but Mr. Mr. Williams is talking about the issue of fugitivity here. And, yes. and he said that your client spit on the American flag was his conclusion. You reach a different conclusion. And let me ask Mr. White. Mr. Weinberg, do you think that this fellow is a fugitive from well, justice? Well, he is a fugitive. What Mr. Quinn's talking about, I mean, w when there's an outstanding arrest warrant for you and you've been indicted, and you know about it and you don't turn yourself in, you're a fugitive, whether you took a vacation to Switzerland, because he was living in New York at the time, but whether you took a vacation to Switzerland and chose to not come back or not, you're a fugitive. What he's saying is, is that, is that he didn't commit the crime of bail jumping because there wasn't bail set because he hadn't been indicted when he chose apparently not to come back. But he's a fugitive. I mean, there, up until the pardon, there were arrest warrants. The marshals have been quoted recently as saying he was on the top ten list. They've made numerous, um, uh, they, they've tried many times to capture him. Uh, there have been a number of extradition requests. Uh, he chose not to come back. He's a fugitive. Uh, did, Mr. Did Abbach, how do you feel? The gentleman's uh, time has, has could expired. Could I just ask Mr. Abbach to answer the question sure, and I'll be sure. done? Mr. Abbach, how do you feel about this fugitivity issue? There is no question that Mark Rich and Pincus Green were fugitives and knew it. We sought their extradition from Switzerland. And if you look at our agreement with their companies with respect to their guilty pleas, they specifically provided that we would wait to see whether the Swiss were going to grant our extradition request. Because if they were, we reserved the right to go ahead to trial, as they did. And it was only when it was clear that they were not going to get extradited as fugitives that we proceeded. I thank you. And I yield to you. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weinberg, I think you, um, in one phrase or one sentence, really summed up why we're here. Uh, nobody in this room seriously believes that uh, uh, we're here because uh, uh, all of us on this committee and the American people don't understand that there are other important things that Congress needs to be doing. Congress is doing those things. Uh, if members on the other side want to uh, work on health care for the elderly and prescription drugs, then they ought to be on those committees. That's not what brings us here today. What brings us here today is, as you said uh, in your testimony, uh, how our sis judicial system is supposed to work. Uh, that's really what brings us here. Uh, some on the other side may think that simply because we are at the core of this discussion talking about a constitutional authority, uh, that there's nothing that any of us can do about it once the president exercises uh, anything that is a power under which the constitution he has then we all have to just back away and say and bow down and say uh, yes sir we can't look into this it's black magic uh, we have to go away and just accept what you've done uh, i think all of us here whether we're, uh, anybody's willing to admit it or not understand that that's not the way our system of government operates we have an obligation here the same as you uh, and Mr. Auerbach have an obligation, uh, as does Mr. Quinn, to see that justice is done, to uphold our system of laws, our system of checks and balances. Uh, and if, in fact, there is evidence, as there is in this case, that the system has not worked, that it perhaps has been subverted in some way, then we have a, a legitimate reason to look into it, to try and at least bring to the attention of the American people that something wrong has gone on here, and if steps can be taken, 
uh, to take those steps. Uh, also, in looking at the, a grant of, uh, of executive clemency or a pardon, uh, we're not operating in a, in a vacuum here. We're not operating as if President Clinton is the first person ever to uh, extend grants of clemency or to grant pardons. There is, in fact, uh, a long uh, history uh, of documentation. There is a very clear process and procedure under which every prior president until this president at the 11th hour of his administration has followed. Uh, there are documents to lay out that process and procedure, such as, for example, in the United States Attorney's Manual. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to include the, uh, these pages from the U.S. Attorney's Manual that relate to grants of clemency and pardons. In the Without record. objection. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we look, for example, even at Mr. Quinn's own uh, very well uh, uh, put together, uh, two or three, whatever it is, uh, inches of, uh, of papers in his petition. Uh, the last two tabs of which uh, I and Jay, I believe, uh, include a number of former uh, document, uh, documentation from a number of former presidents uh, regarding grants of clemency and, and uh, uh, executive pardons. Uh, in every one of those, the president uh, lays out the case for the American people why he believes that this pardon is in the interest of justice. Now, we may agree or disagree with it, but it's all there. It's on the record. This president has chosen to operate as he has so many, the, the former president, has chosen to operate as he has so many times in the past with utter disdain and disregard for the process whereby the American people are deemed to have a right to know what's going on, because that's the only way we can tell if justice is in fact being done. Uh, and some of these people may have been hoisted on their own petard. Uh, I uh, would uh, also ask. Uh, Unanimous consent to include in the record the executive grant of clemency signed by uh, former President uh, Clinton on January 20th in this case. Without objection. And also uh, a letter from the Department of Justice dated February 6, 2001, uh, which lists uh, some 44, it looks like, uh, individuals listed uh, in the prior document. Without objection. Who uh, did not submit uh, petitions. Uh, and uh, as to at least those people, I think a very uh, legitimate question can be raised that their pardons or grants of clemency are not valid, uh, are void ab initio because uh, in, in, in his rush to judgment or his effort to obfuscate or not answer questions or lay out for the American people, uh, what President Clinton uh, did in this case is simply list uh, dozens upon dozens of individuals, including uh, uh, Messrs. Rich and, uh, and Green, uh, and uh, without giving any reason or any details, and simply saying that he hereby grants a full and unconditional pardon to all the following named persons for those offenses against the United States described in each such request. Uh, a question apparently that some folks, including perhaps some of us, will look into is as to all of the people uh, who did not submit a request, uh, there can't be a pardon because we don't know the terms of it. Mr. Rich, however, did submit a petition, uh, a very lengthy petition, uh, and uh, one that uh, lays out in great detail, as you described it, Mr. Weinberg, a, a, an advocacy. Uh, he is advocating, Mr. Quinn is advocating uh, a position. Uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That's how the pardon or executive clemency process starts in, in virtually every case. Not every case, but, but most cases. What happened thereafter, though, is very unusual. Uh, there is no documentation from the Department of Justice. There is no documentation from the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Department of State, all of which are agencies that in the case of a fugitive, a foreign fugitive from justice, as to whom uh, very serious allegations and evidence has been raised regarding trading with the enemy and so forth, uh, normally would be consulted. That's a very serious question. Why was uh, the president so eager to grant Mr. Rich a pardon uh, base, uh, without, uh, without looking into any of these, uh, any of these matters. Uh, these are, in fact, very serious, and this is the reason why we're having this hearing and why we'll have the, uh, the petition uh, or the, uh, the, nec the next panel. Uh, and I have some specific questions, but I think uh, we'll probably have some additional time, Mr. Chairman, to go into specific questions. We will, and I'll try to see that we yield you what time that you, you need. Mr. Waxman.
Be recognized for 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Well, it's clear uh, from the testimony we received to this point, there's a strong difference of opinion on this panel regarding the merits of pardoning uh, Mark Rich. Uh, Mr. Weinberg, you clearly believe that Mitch, Mr. Rich does not deserve a pardon. Is That's that correct? correct. And uh, Mr. Auerbach, you agree with Mr. Weinberg on Absolutely, that? Absolutely, Mr. Waxman. And Mr. Quinn, you obviously disagree with the prosecutors. You, you feel that the pardon was justified on the merits. Is that your position? Yes, sir. Well, based on what I've heard on this matter, I would have to agree with the prosecutors on the merits of this pardon. It seems to me that the arguments against granting Mr. Rich a pardon outweigh the arguments in favor of granting him a pardon. If, if I were considering this matter, I, I wouldn't have reached this conclusion. Uh, uh, there is a tremendous difference, however, between a bad judgment and a criminal conduct. Some people believe that the President uh, Clinton acted illegally or corruptly in granting the pardon. I'm not sure that the evidence sustains this theory. The evidence, in my opinion, sustains the theory that the President used incredibly bad judgment. Mr. Quinn, of, of the witnesses here today, you had the most extensive first-hand knowledge about the President's consideration of the pardon. You had direct contact with the President regarding the matter. Do you have any reason to believe that the President's conduct in the pardon was in any way criminal or corrupt? Absolutely not. And in, in point of fact, um, as I said earlier, and I would like to repeat it, um, not a single word of the conversation I had with him about this matter had to do with anything other than the merits of this case. And if I may, um, it's very hard in this format to be able to respond to everything that is, that's being thrown up here. And, and again, I'm going to try to weave into my answers some of the responses uh, to, to, to the comments that lead you to the conclusion you just articulated. But I'd like to make this point. Number one, uh, the two tax authorities whose opinion was central to my effort, Professor Martin Ginsburg of Georgetown and Bernard Wolfman of Harvard, they accepted the allegations in the indictment as being true when they did their analysis. That is how I read and understand their opinion. Secondly, the, the prosecutors to my left conveniently never choose to talk about RICO. There have been references here to these defendants being exposed to being jailed for 300 years. The reason for that was because of the RICO charge. In 1989, the Department of Justice said that in precisely this sort of case, it's inappropriate to rely on the racketeering statute. Thirdly, what they didn't tell you is that another agency of the United States government, the Department of Energy, saw this case in precisely the opposite way that they did. The Department of Energy analyzed these transactions in a proceeding against ARCO. ARCO is the oil company here with which Mr. Rich was doing most of his trading. ARCO paid millions of dollars of fines because it had failed to link the domestic transactions in which they were engaged with foreign oil transactions. The prosecutors in concluding that Rich owed 100 million or, or evaded taxes on $100 million completely overlook or reject the reality that those transactions were linked to foreign transactions that involved Rich paying significantly more for oil than it was worth and that results in a very significant reduction of that hundred million dollars. Th this is admittedly enormously complex, but the, the point I want to make here is that this case was about tax evasion, mail and wire fraud, RICO, and uh, the violation of the IEPA regulations involving trading with Iran. The RICO count could never have been brought today. The Department of Justice policy 
prohibits the use of RICO in a case like this. The mail and wire fraud cases could not be brought today under a line of cases beginning with McNally in the Supreme Court of the United States. The tax evasion case, and, and, and I understand that, that these gentlemen want to dismiss the analysis of Ginsburg and Wolfman or dismiss the, the view of the United States Department of Energy about what was going on in these transactions. But there is another side to these charges. Well, and, and, it, it, and the point in response to your question yeah. is that whether at the end of the day you believe that their view of it is better than my view, mm -hmm. what I assure you is that it is my view and that discussion that occupied the communication I had with the president. It, it was clear to me that he had read this material. Where did the president get this material? From you? Yes, sir. I filed this uh, petition uh, on December 11th. And do you know whether he had any other input in reaching his conclusion than the petition you filed? Uh, yes, I, I'm confident he had other input. I'm confident of that um, from, from several facts. Um, one, among other things, his former chief of staff, Mr. Podesta, said on Nightline that this was a matter that was, in fact, vigorously debated in the White House over a period of time. I don't know whether he said 10 days or two weeks, something to that effect. Um, secondly, um, I knew in the course of dealings I had with the White House Counsel's Office that they were engaged in uh, discussions with him. Uh, and then thirdly, as I think you know, I believe um, that admittedly late, but that at um, some point in the process, the White House Counsel's Office uh, consulted with the Department of Justice. In fact, with the senior person at the Department of Justice with the responsibility for being liaison with the White House on pardon matters. Well, in the next panel, we're going to go into some of the issues of whether the President had the benefit of the the analysis of others who could advise them on, right. on the merits of this right. case. And, and I can't tell you, by the way, w whether the intelligence agencies, are, I, I don't know the answer to the question, wh who else may have participated in, in his deliberations on that? I, well, I know it, part of the story. It, it's my view that if a president is going to make a decision like this, he have the input from all the sources that and all the information that's relevant to his uh, decision making. Your obligation as a lawyer for your client is not to provide all that information, but to represent your client's case. Isn't that correct? Y yes, sir. And, and, and I do feel that the application was filed um, at a time that permitted, um, th that would have allowed any consultation that, that one would deem necessary or appropriate. I don't know whether the President got all the information he should have had before he made this decision. My guess is maybe he didn't. Yeah. I don't know whether uh, the, uh, the, the uh, President's decision on, the, on, this, on this issue was uh, uh, because he, I, I gather the President's decision on the merits was because he saw the merits as, as, as you do in his uh, conclusion. From my point of view, it's a complicated matter. My, uh, impression from the testimony I've received is that that isn't the conclusion I would have reached had I been the President of the United States, but I'm not the President. President Clinton has a constitutional authority to evaluate this. Uh, if he didn't fully evaluate it, we should be critical of him. If he made a bad decision on the, on the merits, we should be critical of him. But the question, it seems to me, other than being critical of, of uh, his conclusion, is was there any wrongdoing in reaching that conclusion? Um, it seems to me, Mr. Quinn, from your answers, you believe that the President acted properly. One can disagree with the conclusion that he reached, but not with the fact that he used his best judgment. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Was there any quid pro quo for gifts or campaign contributions? I don't believe so. I, I never had a conversation with him about those matters. Um, I saw no evidence of that being on his mind uh, when he spoke to me about the merits of this case. He said nothing about it. Uh, 
Uh, and in point of fact, um, to a very great extent, I didn't know about it. Um, so it just wasn't part of the, the, the dialogue that I had with him. And I, I have seen uh, in, in my dealings with him, uh, with the Department of Justice, and with lawyers at the White House, um, simply no evidence of any of them having been mindful of, of those things. Mr. Weinberg or Mr. Arbach, are you aware, either of you, of any direct evidence that corruption was involved in President Clinton's pardon of Mark well, Rich? Well, neither of us would. I mean, we're in private practice. Uh, all I can say is, is, that, is that, from my perspective, and I've said this before, I can see no legitimate reason to grant two people that were international fugitives who had renounced their citizenship where the evidence was so overwhelming, and I won't get into the facts, but I mean, what Mr. Quinn said is just, it, it, it's really preposterous uh, based on what the evidence was uh, at the time. You know, flated invoices, you know, off the record transactions, people talking about pots. I mean, all of that, if, 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 if that were the case, uh, if, the, if the case were the, that this had no merit to it, then one does wonder why uh, the only alternative, according to Mr. Quinn, is a presidential pardon. I mean, why not just come back and try the case? But you, know, well, you just don't see how he could have reached that conclusion on the merits. That's your view. Mr. Quinn has a different view. The president had to make his decision. You think his decision was incorrect. Do you, you don't have any information, however, that he reached that conclusion no, I doubt on, that on, any, uh, on any direct evidence of... Uh, of wrongdoing or corruption, do you? No, you don't have the, the right people here to, I mean, I'm talking about for me or Mr. Auerbach to, okay. to weigh in on that. I mean, well, it I, would have been nice to hear the other side of the story. And so if I were the president, you know, if I had to, if I got to argue both sides, I'd never lose a case as a trial lawyer. And, and in the president's case, you would, have, you, you would have hoped that he would have heard from somebody that knew something about the case from well, the I prosecution have, side. I would have hoped so, too. I, yeah. I, I, I fully support that position. And, I'm confident uh, that he did. The president made his, you're, con you're confident he did not. I'm confident that he did not from my conversations with people in the Southern District, the IR, you know, and various other um, people that were involved in the case. You, you may well be right, and I, I have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to I'm sorry. Interrupt. But you may, you may well be right that he didn't get uh, uh, all sides argued as fully as he should have. Uh, he was making a last-minute decision. There was a long list of pardons that he had to uh, uh, conclude, uh, some of which he denied, many of which he granted. I don't know how many he had before him. But uh, we have other presidents who've made last-minute decisions on pardons that, for which we genuinely can be critical. President Bush's pardon of Casper uh, Weinberger was going to go to trial then, within weeks. And uh, uh, there, there are other, other, uh, other pardons that were granted that we could look at and say, how could, how could the president have ever reached that conclusion? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem, appear to be correct on the merits. But unless there's some wrongdoing, all we can say is what a terrible judgment that the president uh, exercised. I want to yield some of my time to uh, my colleagues. Uh, Mr. Towns, let me yield to you about five minutes. I'll be very brief. Um, uh, someone raised the question of ethics, Mr. Quinn. Uh, and I'd like to ask you... Uh, did you feel you violated the ethics ban by contacting the White House about the Mark Rich pardon? Absolutely not. Um, and I'll be happy to explain why. But please, yes. Um, uh, I should tell you in advance that I was one of the principal authors of that uh, ethics uh, uh, regulation. Um, and so I certainly believe I know what was intended by everything in this regulation. 
Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Thank you. 
With my being on both panels, that it's a long day, and so I will confess there may be some things that have slipped by me too. Okay. But I don't think that uh, that reference to the mayor has been part of this hearing. I, I, I didn't think so either. But but I do want to turn to your January the fifth letter to the president of the United States, where you do write, uh, and I think that that's a exhibit number eighty nine. If you want to follow along in our program, where you talked about the outrageously prejudicial and unfair treatment of him by the then new U.S. attorney in New York, Mr. Giuliani. Uh, is, that, is that your conclusion, that uh, Mr. Rich suffered uh, outrageously prejudicial and unfair treatment at the hands of Rudolph Giuliani? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, fellas, how about you, Mr. Weinberg, Mr. Arbach? Well, how do you, how do you feel I'm about sorry. that? I'm sorry. What's the... It, it, it's not... I don't think it's... It's not 89? 89. Okay. I, and anyway, I, I'm familiar with the letter. You, you wrote a letter to the president on January 5th. Yes, sir. And, and you remember using the words outrageously prejudicial and unfair treatment by um, Mr. Giuliani? If, if, if you're reading it... Um, <laughs> I'm confident that that's what I said. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. I, th I think that the treatment must have been me and not uh, by me and not Rudy because uh, Rudy had very little to do with the case until at the end of the case uh, when he participated in the in um, uh, negotiating the guilty pleas. Actually, the investigation was done under John Martin. Uh, John Martin uh, now uh, is judge. now a federal judge in the Southern District of New York. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to say that, that I, I do not believe that it is fair to characterize anything that we did, and I was a 31-year-old prosecutor then, right. during the investigation as unfair. The reason that Mr. Rich and Mr. Green uh, really found themselves in the position that they found themselves in is because the extraordinary things that they did during the investigation to obstruct it, the contempt fines, the steamer trunks, selling the, trying to, to sell the uh, American corporation secretly that the court found was fraudulent, their fugitivity. I mean, this extraordinary effort to, to avoid turning over documents. They, I mean, the Swiss government, quote, seized some documents in Switzerland so that they couldn't be turned over, and then they, they were the safe haven for, uh, for uh, Mr. Rich and Mr. Green so they couldn't be extradited. I mean, the reason that this case you know, attracted the attention that it did was not because of Sandy Weinberg. It wasn't because of Martin Auerbach. It certainly wasn't because of Rudy Giuliani, who wasn't even around at the time when all this publicity was going on. It was because of the extraordinary things, the extraordinary, I would say, misdeeds that took place during the investigation. But let me ask you this. Are you fellows familiar with a gentleman by the name of Robert Litt? Yes. Should sure. Robert Litt have something to do with this? At the, yeah, at the I'll tell you, yep. I will explain to you what Robert Litt had to do with this. Robert Litt was in the, um, was in the appellate section. Bob is, uh, is a very close personal friend of mine and actually is a partner at uh, Mr. Quinn's old law firm and was in the Justice Department before this. Right. Mr. Litt worked on the appellate board. There were six appeals in this case. This, this person, Mr. Rich, who had these wonderful lawyers involved, brought six appeals during the investigation. We were in the, in the Second Circuit six times. That's how, that's how aggressively they litigated it. And Mr. Litt and Mr. Lynch, who one of the letters was to in the early 90s, is now a federal judge, they were both in the appellate section and were served honorably. And um, they worked on, on, on uh, these extraordinary <coughs> appellate issues that we had during the investigation. And, and Mr. Lynch, if I understand, you're talking about a fellow named Gerald Lynch? Yes. He's been nominated and he's now on the federal bench at the appointment of President Clinton, is he not? <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, he's the best lawyer I've ever worked with in my entire life. And, and if I remembered Robert Litt, aside from being a partner of, of Mr. Quinn's at one time at Porter and Arnold, he was also nominated to head the criminal division at the Justice Department during the time that Mr. Quinn served as uh, counsel to the president. Does that That's correct. sound about right? Thank you. I have nothing. May to I add a point? Uh, sure, go ahead. In response, um, in terms of the the basis for my making the statement I did in the letter, I'm going to read to you um, three short clips from the Wall Street Journal. The first reads: It's worth taking a second look at Mr. Giuliani's first big RICO case. This was the much-celebrated 1984 case against Mark Rich, the wealthy oil trader. A close reading of the allegations shows that these also effectively reduced to tax charges. The core of the case is that Mr. Rich wrongly attributed domestic income to a foreign subsidiary. Again, this sounds like a standard civil tax issue, not RICO. Second clip, again from the Wall Street Journal. 
The Department of Justice should launch a complete review of all U.S. Attorney RICO cases. From Mr. Giuliani's first RICO expanding case against Mark Rich in 1984, through the current allegations, allegations against Chicago pit traders and Michael Milken. Third Wall Street Journal. The major prior RICO abuse was when Rudolph Giuliani, the former U.S. attorney in Manhattan, in 1984 RICO'd oil trader Mark Rich on essentially, essentially on tax grounds. And, and it goes on. Um, I wasn't operating on the basis of in, in an information vacuum, others have, have characterized the use of RICO in cases like this, in the words of the Wall Street Journal, as abusive. Right. All right, if I could just say one thing, take one second. As long as uh, the just chairman so lets me go, you can talk as long as you want. Right, just, just so everybody understands what the process was, in order to bring, in order for the U.S. Attorney's Office to bring a RICO or a tax charge back in 1983 when these gentlemen were indicted, it had to be approved and reviewed in the Justice Department. The RICO charge was approved by the RICO section of justice, and the tax charge was approved in the tax division. Because of the process, we notified Edward Bennett Williams in advance of the indictment that we were considering RICO, and obviously that we were recommending tax charges. Mr. Williams had an opportunity to have a review, to, to, to set forth all of his arguments to the Justice Department, not the U.S. Attorney's Office, we're beyond that, to the Justice Department, both as to the RICO charge and as to the tax charge. Those arguments were considered back in 1983, and the Justice Department, which was, you know, this was President Reagan's administration, the Justice Department in 1983 specifically approved filing RICO charges and approved filing the tax charges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Davis. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Waxman, did you want to take some of your time? Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just take this time. Uh, the, the, we have had a, a taste of this case. I can't say that we have dug into it in detail. The three of you know it in great detail. And um, it sounds to me whenever you have some of these very complicated transactions, whether it was a tax evasion or tax avoidance becomes a real serious question. The RICO issues have been quite controversial. Um, you say there might be money laundering charge today, but there wasn't then. Um, I don't know that this committee can make a final judgment as on the merits. The president, however, was the one who had to make some judgment. And he had to make a decision whether to exercise that unique power that a president has, which is to show clemency or to grant a pardon. We can disagree with his conclusion. And we can also question whether he had enough information to reach the conclusion. So I, I know the chairman said this is worth doing to give some signal to all presidents that when they make this decision, it might be examined by a committee of Congress. But you know, let's don't kid ourselves. Uh, I don't know that we're going to have any careful examination of this president, President Bush's decisions, as carefully scrutinized as we've had in this committee of President Clinton. For example, if we're looking for things to examine, does anyone think that if the decision in Florida hadn't been reversed and that, and that uh, Mr. Gore was determined to be the president, that this committee wouldn't be issuing subpoenas all over the place to examine what went on in Florida. But we're not looking at that at all, even though we know that thousands of people were disenfranchised in Florida and didn't get their votes uh, counted, maybe legitimately, maybe not. <clears throat> but that's not the topic that, the, that this committee majority has decided to hold <coughs> hearings on. This committee majority has decided to hold hearings on an action by President Clinton, which many of us uh, disagree with, but which he uh, had the constitutional authority to, to, uh, to take. Um, in, in, the, in the few minutes I have left, Mr. Quinn, Mr. Arbach, uh, Mr. Weinberg, uh, starting with you, Mr. Quinn, anything you want to say that you haven't had a chance to say? We fire questions and we get this thing in a very piecemeal uh, fashion. 
Any points that you think we ought to know about that uh, you don't feel you've had a chance to make or you want to elaborate on? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I think that um, you've heard from the prosecutors why they brought the charges they did uh, against Mr. Rich and others. It, you've heard from me why we thought the indictment was flawed. Um, you have in front of you uh, the indictment, you have the legal arguments laid out in the petition. Um, I, I don't feel I've um, left anything out, frankly. Um, so, no, I, I don't think I need to embellish further the arguments we made. I guess the one thing that does con Could you speak of the, the uh, one thing that does concern me about about all of this and about the submission, particularly that part of the submission that talks about you know how the case was meritless and it was a house of cards and all that stuff, and it just sort of dismisses everything. You know, it's it, whether it's RICO or the wire and mail fraud or tax, whatever it is, it's all dismissed. The fact that the companies pled guilty, that's dismissed because they had to plead guilty, according to Mr. Quinn, because they were extorted uh, through all this um, uh, But aren't you, just, aren't you just saying the petition on behalf of Mr. Rich put the best face on everything well, and I think ignore it, the, the, well, the negative I think, side of it? I the, think that what I'm saying yes. is, is that it would, have been, it would have been, I think, fundamentally fair if we're looking for justice here or the, or the exercise of justice, mm -hmm. if Mr. Quinn or somebody had pointed out to the president that when, when he is told that the company's pled guilty and he shouldn't, he shouldn't consider that, that actually when the guilty pleas took place on October 11, 1984 in front of federal judge Shirley Cram, that Mark Rich's lawyers stood up in court and told the judge, when the judge asked him, what did the, these companies do wrong? And what they said, amongst the things they said was, on page 18 of that transcript, beginning in September 1980, International, which was the Mark Rich company in the United States, generated millions of dollars of income from crude oil transactions, which International should have disclosed but intentionally did not disclose to the Internal Revenue Service and the Department of Energy. And then later in here, acknowledged that false documents had been, had been um, uh, delivered to the Department of Energy, hiding those p illegal domestic profits, and that the company, the American company, had failed to report millions of dollars of taxable income that they didn't pay taxes on. And so to come in here 18 years later and say that the case was a sham, the case was meritless, meritless, is to say that Peter Fleming, one of the most distinguished lawyers in New York City in the country, and Peter Zimroth, one of the most distinguished lawyers in New York, when they stood up in front of a federal judge and said those things, having been authorized by their client over in Switzerland to say those things, that were just, they, they, they were just, just not telling the truth. No. And, and it's just uh, not right. It's not fair. My, my time is up, but could you uh, let Mr. Well, Quinn respond, uh, and then I'm sure we're going to have to move on. Yeah, and, and we've heard that now twice, and that, that's an accurate representation of what happened. It is also the position of my clients that this RICO sledgehammer, which would have destroyed this company, caused them to enter into a plea bargain on behalf of the company with the prosecutors. Um, as I stated earlier in my testimony, I'm not the only one who was of that view. Uh, I was one of a long line of respected attorneys as, uh, as, as well thought of as Mr. Fleming, who shared my view about this, and we discussed earlier who some of those people are. Let me just say, Mr. Chairman, just in conclusion, uh, when Democrats have raised the issue about Florida, we've been told to get over it, stop whining. Well, it just seems to me if the approach is that the election is over and what's done is done, then it's hard for me to understand the rationale for continuing to investigate Bill Clinton if there's no illegality in the rich pardon. And it seems uh, very close to a double standard and somewhat partisan that we spend our time going after, looking for things about Bill Clinton to criticize and pay no heed to uh, concerns that people have on other issues like the denial of 
participation in the electoral democratic process by so many people in Florida and throughout the country, particularly those who are minorities and, and, and seniors who uh, didn't have their votes counted. Thank you. Let me just conclude uh, with this panel that uh, if the RICO charges were so frivolous, then uh, why, uh, why uh, uh, didn't they stand trial? Uh, were they afraid they'd be convicted? And, 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 and I think the case needs to be made that uh, if, uh, if they thought they had a meritorious defense and they had the best lawyers in the country and they thought they could win the case, why did they renounce their citizenship, try to sneak documents out of the country, flee the country, and have been gone 17 years? Why didn't they stand trial? Did they think that our judicial system is so corrupt that uh, they would have been convicted and put in jail on uh, charges that were not meritorious? I mean, wh why didn't they stand, char uh, stand trial? Uh, they had the best lawyers in the country. Yeah. Uh, look, Mr. Chairman, um, what I think is the honest answer to that is that they were not willing to expose themselves to 300 years in jail over what they thought was a tax and energy dispute. So they thought they might be convicted. Now, so they thought they might be convicted. Of course, they must okay, well, have. Why did they, they think they might be convicted? I think they thought that they were going to be exposed to 300 years in jail for something they didn't do. Well, but be the point is, if you're innocent, we have a very fair uh, system of justice in this country where the laws apply equally to everybody. According uh, to the prosecuting attorneys or the people who are bringing this case, they had separate sets of books. They had a pot, they called it, a pot where they stuck their devious monies so that the IRS and the go government of this country could not find them. And when the, all this was uncovered, they tried to smuggle the documents out of the country. They left the country. They became fugitives. They changed their citizenship and ran all over the world. At one point, we know that U.S. Marshals were on their tail and they were in a jet plane and they got messages from somebody in the United States that the U.S. Marshal was in a plane trailing them and they turned around and went back to Switzerland. That doesn't sound like people yeah. who really feel that uh, the, the justice system in this country works. There must have been something more to it. Well, uh, Mr. Burton, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me respond to as much of that as I can very briefly. Um, I wasn't involved with them 17 years ago. Um, I hope I can tell you honestly, I would never ever encourage uh, a client to flee the jurisdiction. I know I can tell you with complete sincerity, I would never condone or encourage the renunciation of one's American citizenship. Um, with regard to this alleged pot of money, uh, this goes to the monies that were part of the Department of Energy analysis of these transactions. And again, another agency of the federal government concluded that Rich and not ARCO had correctly uh, accounted for these transactions. I was dealing with the four corners of the indictment in front of me. I couldn't rewrite their history, sir. Well, let me just, uh, I, I won't make any more points about this. I think we've covered it all pretty thoroughly. But if Mr. Weinberg or Mr. Arbach want to conclude, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll then conclude this, uh, this panel. I, I, w I would just try to respond to what uh, Congressman Waxman said and what other people on the committee have said today, which is that there seems to be a fairly widespread view that at a minimum the president made a mistake when he granted this pardon. And I would say that at this point, one of the things this committee could do is look to the future and look to Mr. Rich and Mr. Green's future. And I hope that in your government oversight role, you will ensure that the appropriate government agencies do everything within their power to not compound this mistake. Mr. Weinberg, anything else? Yeah, I, I just appreciate the opportunity of having appeared here today. And um, I agree with much of what um, Representative Waxman has said. I was also, I'm also a Florida citizen, so I'm not sure my vote counted or not. Uh, but but um, I, I, I appreciate, um, Chairman Burton, you looking at this, because I think that from my perspective, as, as, a, as the prosecutor, but as a defense lawyer um, as well since then, that that the system of justice has, has really been done a disservice in this case.
that to reward um, two individuals who, in my opinion, uh, thumbed their nose at the system from day one, who committed, I believe, one of the biggest tax frauds in the history of the United States, who did everything they could um, to obstruct our investigation, whether it was not turning over documents or trying to smuggle documents out of the country or trying to um, spirit assets away from the court so that they couldn't enforce the fines, who, who then chose to do what no, basically no other citizens in this country can do, and that is find a safe haven and from a distance for 17 years you know, uh, try to put their defense on through a series of lawyers like Mr. Quinn, who without anybody on the other side say that this case had no merit. For, for people to be allowed to do that, renunciate their citizenship, whether there's some technical defense or not, which I do not believe that there is, to, to trade with enemies of the United States uh, while they were American citizens, for sure, because that's what was charged in this case, and whatever they've done since. To reward people like that with the ultimate act of mercy is an outrage. And, and I, as, a, as, a, as the prosecutor, I, as a defense lawyer, I, as a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat, I can't find another word for it. I'm outraged by it, and I agree with Representative Waxman. If there's no criminality, and I'm not sure that this committee can, can make that determination today, if there's no criminality, there's nothing that you can do about it because it's an absolute power. But, but it is an outrage, and it should be, and, and I'm proud to say, to be here today to say that it's an outrage, and I do not believe that Mr. Clinton was given the full and complete story because I happen to believe that he is way too intelligent and smart to believe that it was appropriate to pardon two people that did not fit one criteria for pardons. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weinberg and Mr. Auerbach. Uh, Mr. Quinn will ask you to stay for the next panel, and we'll ask Mr. Holder. Is Mr. Holder here? Mr. Chairman, would it be uh, reasonable to ask if we could take five minutes between panels? Sure. We want to make sure you can do whatever needs to be done in five minutes. We'll wait for you. Thank you, sir. Stand in recess for five minutes. The committee will come to order. Uh, Mr. Quinn has already been sworn, so Mr. Holder, would you please stand and raise your right hand? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth will help you out? I do. Mr. Holder, do you have uh, uh, an opening statement you'd like to make? Uh, yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. All right. Proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Waxman, members of the committee, I'm happy, though not as happy as I would have been at 10 o'clock. Uh, to have the opportunity to come before you today to discuss the Justice Department's role in the pardon of Mark Rich. Now, at the outset, I want to emphasize one thing. The career people in the department worked very hard to process all of the pardon requests that came to them in the waning days and hours of the Clinton administration. They are not to be faulted in this matter. As for my own role, although I always acted consistent with my duties and responsibilities as Deputy Attorney General, in hindsight, I wish that I had done some things differently with regard to the Mark Rich matter. Specifically, I wish that I had ensured that the Department of Justice was more fully informed and involved in this pardon process. But let me be very clear, let me be very clear about one important fact. Efforts to portray me as intimately involved or overly interested in this matter are simply at odds with the facts. In truth, because the Mark Rich case did not stand out as one that was particularly meritorious and because there was a very large number of cases that crossed my desk that similarly fit into this category, I never devoted a great deal of time to this matter and it does not now stick in my memory. By contrast, 
I did spend time monitoring cases, especially in those last days, involving people who were requesting commutations of disproportionately long drug sentences. Now, what I'd like to briefly go through a chronology of the relevant e events so as to explain the Department's involvement in this matter. I think my first contact with the Rich case came in late 1999 when Jack Quinn, the former White House counsel, called me and asked me to facilitate a meeting with the prosecutors in the Southern District of New York concerning a client of his named Mark Rich. Excuse me, just one second, Mr. Holder. Uh, do you have copies of your statement? Some members of the committee, do we have copies? Okay, can you hand those out? I'm sorry to interrupt you, proceed. Thank you. Uh, this was not an unusual request. Over the years, other prominent members of the bar and former colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, had asked me to arrange a similar meeting with other offices around the country. Mr. Rich's name was unfamiliar to me. I believe that Mr. Quinn explained that he wanted the U.S. Attorney's Office to drop charges that had been lodged against his client because of changes in the applicable law and department policy. I asked a senior career person on my staff to look into the matter, and ultimately the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office declined to meet with Mr. Quinn. Neither I nor anyone on my staff ever pressed the prosecutors to have the meeting. We simply deferred to them because it was their case. In candor, if I were making the decision as the United States Attorney, I probably would have held a meeting. In my view, the government and the cause of justice often gains from hearing about the flaws, real or imagined, cited by defense counsel in a criminal case. But my only goal was to ensure that the request for a meeting was fully considered. Consequently, I gained only a passing <coughs> familiarity with the underlying facts of the Rich case, and after the prosecutors declined to meet with Mr. Quinn, I had no reason to delve further into this matter. On November 21st, 2000, members of my staff in the United States Marshal Service and I had a meeting with Mr. Quinn and a client of his. Though it was one of eight meetings I had on my schedule that day, I remember the meeting because Mr. Quinn's client had a good idea about using the Internet to help the Marshal Service dispose of properties that had come into its possession as a result of forfeiture actions. Mr. Quinn has recently stated that after the meeting, he told me he was going to file a pardon request on behalf of Mr. Rich at the White House. Now, I have no memory of that conversation, but do not question Mr. Quinn's assertion. His comment would have been a fairly unremarkable one, given my belief that any pardon petition filed with the White House would ultimately be sent to the Justice Department for review and consideration. Mr. Quinn has also recently stated that he sent a note to me about the Rich case on January the 10th. I never received that note. The correct address on the Justice of the Justice Department does not appear on the correspondence. The note ultimately surfaced on the desk of the pardon attorney on January the 18th, less than 48 hours before the pardon was signed by the President. On Friday, January 19th of this year, the last full day of the Clinton administration, when I was dealing with such issues as the death penalty, pressing personnel matters, and most importantly, security issues related to the next day's inauguration, I received a phone call from Mr. Quinn at about 6.30. He told me that I would be getting a call from the White House shortly, and he asked me what my position would be on the pardon request for Mr. Rich. I told him that although I had no strong opposition based on his recitation of the facts, law enforcement in New York would strongly oppose it. I didn't use exactly those <coughs> words. Given Mr. Rich's fugitive status, it seemed clear to me that the prosecutors involved would never support the request. But I did not reflexively oppose it because I had previously supported a successful pardon request for a fugitive, Preston King, who in the context of a select service case had been discriminated against in the 1950s because of the color of his skin. Shortly after my conversation with Mr. Quinn, I received a phone call from the White House counsel, Beth Nolan, no, Nolan asking me my position. Now, I'm not sure if it was Ms. Nolan or Mr. Quinn, I, I just really can't remember, who brought to my attention that brought Prime Minister Barack had weighed in strongly on behalf of the pardon request. But this assertion really struck me. With that significant piece of new information, I ultimately told Ms. Nolan that I was now neutral, leaning towards favorable, if there were foreign policy benefits that would be reaped by granting the pardon. Now, even after my conversation with Ms. Nolan on the evening of January the 19th, I did not think that the pardon request was likely to be granted given Mr. Rich's fugitive status. I continued to believe this until I actually heard that his name had been placed on a list of pardons to be granted by the White House. I was informed of this list around 11 o'clock, uh, perhaps midnight, on the night of the 19th. In retrospect, I now wish that I had placed as much focus on the Rich case as I did on other pardons involving people such as Derek Curry, Dorothy Gaines, and Kemba Smith, all of whom had received extraordinarily long drug sentences, which I strongly believe were not commensurate with their conduct. Now, I am speculating somewhat 
had I known of the reported meeting that night between the President and Counsel for Mr. Rich, I might have become more active in this matter, even at that late date, 